Good evening. I'm Ira Selkowitz, the director of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative at the University of Colorado Denver Business School. And I would like to welcome you to our Ethics in Art Collecting webinar, co-sponsored by the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative and the Center for Art Collection Ethics at the University of Denver and the Colorado chapter of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, which is providing the CPE continuing education credit for this program. I would also like to thank Elizabeth Campbell, the director of the Center for Art Collection Ethics and Corey Cicchetti at the University of Denver for their work in planning this event along with me. The namesake of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative is Bill Daniels, who was a pioneer in the cable television industry, as well as an owner of sports teams. Bill's success in business was due in no small part to his ethical business practices based on eight ethical principles, which you can see on the screen. These principles are integrity, trust, accountability, transparency, fairness, respect, rule of law, and viability. When Bill passed away, his estate went to the Daniels Fund, a private charitable foundation that he had established. One of the programs of the foundation is the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative, which provides grants to instill principle-based ethics at the collegiate level in the four state region of Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. The Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative is comprised of 11 business schools and one law school in this four state region. A major goal of the Ethics Initiative is outreach to the business community. This program is an example of such outreach and we are pleased to have artists, collectors, and representatives of museums and galleries in attendance from all around the US and even internationally. Just a few administrative matters before we begin. For any tech related questions, please use the chat button on your screen. Please use the Q&A button on your screen to ask questions of the panelists. And we will try to get to as many questions as possible. Now I'd like to introduce and welcome our panelists. Renee Albiston is the Associate Museum Director of the Kirkland Museum of Fine and Decorative Art in Denver. Amber Dawn Bearrobe is an Assistant Professor of Art History at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Chris Beekman is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Colorado, Denver. And our moderator, Jeffrey Seamus, is the director of the Vicki Mirren Gallery at the University of Denver. And now I'm going to turn it over to Corey Cicchetti, who is the director of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative at the University of Denver. Thank you and enjoy the program. Ira, thank you so much. I have to give you a lot of the credit for this. And we have almost 300 people here. So what a wonderful event and panelists, thank you. I know my students are here. Just a bit about what we do at the University of Denver ethics wise, I run the um, fellowship program. So we have a bunch of ethics fellows, we call them, and there are about 50 of them. And this quarter, we've decided to adopt a couple small businesses and help them through these tough times. And so they're looking at adopting a daycare and adopting a restaurant. And we provide them with funds, but we don't just give them money. It's sort of how can we help you and how can you incorporate ethics into what you're doing in your business? And so my students, they have to go through three shark tanks in order to get their proposals approved. And so we just did one and it was okay. They're pretty good. Um, but we, we've really done some good with that. And then we do ethics boot camps, and about 600 students every year get to apply the ethical theories they're learning in class to real life. So we do a lot of that. And um, so that's what we do at DU. And, and I just really appreciate all of your support and being here tonight. And now I'd like to introduce Jeffrey, who is our moderator. And uh, his background is wonderful. That's not a fake background, that's his real house. Go ahead, Jeffrey, take over. That's right. Uh, it's some wonderful uh, wallpaper here, but thanks you and uh, thanks everyone who, who signed up for this. Uh, it's really incredible that we have so many people here tonight. I think this is a really fascinating topic. Uh, as Corey said, I'm Jeffrey Seamus. I'm the director of the Vicki Mirren Gallery at the University of Denver. Uh, I also oversee their art collection there. Um, as a background, I'm an art historian. I, I specialized in the art of Northern uh, Europe uh, during the Renaissance. Um, and I've had the, the sort of honor of working at a bunch of different collecting institutions over the years, um, from the Yale University Art Gallery to uh, the Cantor Arts Center at Stanford, um, the Metropolitan Museum, 
Um, and so, you know, these questions and considerations about um, ethical stewardship of collections and, and how we uh, collect objects ethically um, is something that has sort of uh, been a part of my um, career over the years and something I, I think about often. Um, in addition to Corey's um, ethical initiatives, um, you know, Ira mentioned as well that DU has the Center for Art Collection Ethics, um, which was founded by uh, Professor Beth Campbell. Um, that center really promotes the ethical stewardship of uh, collections and objects and um, does that through sort of building awareness of um, important issues uh, in this field and then training, um, you know, hopefully another generation of students and professionals to do the kinds of research that it will require uh, to make some of these ethical um, decisions down the road about what to do with objects. Um, and so, you know, really excited to discuss some of that here with you tonight with the panelists. Um, you know, for anyone who is signed up, I'm, I'm sure you're already excited about the topic, but, um, you know, the overlap between art and business ethics, I think, um, maybe merits a, just a quick mention. Um, you know, it, it's not an obvious, uh, maybe, uh, tie-in, but, um, you know, the art market globally is sort of a huge um, business. It's a $67 billion business in, in 2018. That was 40 million separate transactions. Uh, you know, those are the ones that were sort of counted. There were many probably off uh, the books as well. And a lot of those, you know, weren't, you know, totally transparent. And so it's something that we'll um, talk about. Um, there's also a huge black market for art. Um, after drugs and guns, it is the largest, um, sort of illicit criminal enterprise in the world. So, um, you know, the, the, the trade in looted artifacts and art is, is pretty huge. Um, so again, something important to consider um, as we look at institutions, individuals, dealers, and their sort of interactions um, with art and ethics. Um, so before I turn it over to the, the, the panelists to discuss, you know, some of the things we'll be thinking about tonight are um, you know, how collecting art and artifacts has sort of deep roots in global trade. Um, and global trade um, often sort of has its roots in, in conflict and in colonialism, uh, conquest. Uh, so what are the responsibilities of collectors, um, individuals who collect or institutions, dealers uh, or nations um, as they participate in the buying and selling uh, and the possession of this sort of artistic and cultural um, these objects. And then what are the legal and ethical principles that guide current practices for collection stewardship and interpretation? So those are sort of the, some of the broad um, umbrellas that we'll be considering as we uh, get to hear from our really top-notch, incredible panelists. I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves, uh, and then they're going to sort of present a little bit about um, who they are, the work they do, and how it relates to our topics. After that, we'll have some uh, conversation amongst ourselves. If you have questions um, as we're talking, you can put them in that Q&A and we'll try to get to them as we're talking. But at around eight, we'll try to um, you know, stop our, our conversation so we can really address what uh, is of interest to you uh, out there. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Chris Beekman and let him uh, tell us a little bit more about himself and his work. Sure. I would be happy to. I will uh, start my present or my uh, few slides here to illustrate my um, my research. I am a uh, an archaeologist and an associate professor at the University of Colorado Denver, and um, I work primarily. Uh, my field work is in Western Mexico, and the work there has has deeply colored my own approach, my own focus within the issue of, uh, of collection of, of art. And um, I've used both uh, archeological field data and the pre-Columbian or before Columbus artwork from this region. And uh, West Mexico is uh, for good or ill, it is uh, well known uh, to uh, art collectors and to the art world for what are known as uh, the uh, shaft tomb figures. Uh, hollow ceramic pieces like you see here that uh, pertain uh, almost exclusively to a, uh, a block of about 800 years in time from uh, 300 BC to AD 500. And uh, I see uh, on a pretty regular basis the issue of the, the destruction associated with the, um, 
uh, illicit excavations, collection, and uh, uh, exportation of these materials. The, uh, and these may be familiar to you from, uh, for those of you of a certain age, to, uh, from the Kahlua ads at one point. The figures being used to sell Kahlua were uh, from a, one particular private collection. Now, um, shaft tomb figures are, as a category of pre-Columbian art, they, are, um, they began to be actually collectible comparatively late, as opposed to items that were, let's say, collected at the time of the Spanish conquest or shortly after uh, Mexico was opened up after independence in 1821. Uh, West Mexican shaft tomb figures only became uh, an object of interest in, uh, really in, in, in the 20th century. Uh, you had some large collections that began to be made by artists like Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Uh, but even then, um, the, the popularity was, was relatively limited in scope. Where it really blew up was after about 1935, uh, when you had galleries in the United States, and particularly the uh, Stendhal and Brummer galleries, uh, on opposite coasts that began to um, uh, were, uh, sell pre-Columbian art. And West Mexican objects were particularly, uh, were a bit distinct as a category because they were not made of precious material, not of jade, not of gold or something like that, but instead were, um, made, were branded in, in my thinking as an, a particular object to appeal to a certain kind of audience. And by 1970, there were estimates that were, there were about 10,000 of these figures in um, public and private collections. And all this is in spite of the fact that laws existed by the end of the 19th century, prohibiting the removal of uh, Mexican antiquities from the country. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, legal reason, the, that rule, uh, law was not accepted by the U.S. courts until after uh, UNESCO became involved with, with the broader issue of trafficking. And uh, to give you a, a sense of that, where that 10,000 figures uh, fits, um, by my estimate uh, four years ago was that about 200 of these have ever been excavated uh, by archeologists with, with our own controlled methods where we maintain context and that sort of thing. This obviously deeply colors uh, interpretations of the material. So there's a big impact on scholarship. And um, there's a, um, this is a, a bit of a chart that was put together some time ago, uh, meant to put together a, a, a sort of show the process by which materials are, um, uh, let's say, uh, taken illicitly in Mexico. Um, the pans they go through, um, they're passed through by uh, runners to uh, dealers and end up on the broader art market. And uh, my own experience is kind of, kind of runs the range here from field work uh, within Western Mexico to uh, coming across looted tombs in the region, um, speaking with the looters themselves or the uh, aggregators, and then the people who make fakes, uh, like you see here, the um, working with private collections in Mexico, many of which exist, and many of it can be quite large, um, working with, <laughs> working with uh, on occasion, agents of uh, Department of Homeland Security, who, of course, are concerned with issues of trafficking of various sorts. I have blocked out my friend's face, just in case that's uh, not a good idea for an agent to be uh, uh, outed. Um, and then, of course, working with uh, public collections where many of these uh, items may end up. Um, and, uh, and then most recently, the Getty Institute has been um, uh, brought together a number of people working on this from different perspectives, art historians, art archaeologists, looking to, to try and um, uh, understand the networks by which materials were trafficked. Uh, and make the process by which so many private and public collections were formed a more transparent one. Um, my own work on that has been involved in mapping the relationships between um, galleries and museums and private collectors. And uh, as you can see in this map, what I'm trying to do is link together these different individuals, who's donated to where, who's sold to where, 
and some institutions like the museum in Berlin, for example, blown up in the upper right, have a modest number of collections uh, uh, from different collectors. Other locations like Southern California, uh, the museums and institutes there and collectors, is, it's, a, it's an incredible hotbed of, of connections between all these kinds of individuals. Um, and uh, that is the extent of, uh, of, of my work on this sort of topic. Thank you, Chris. That's a, a rich, uh, you know, field of exploration and, and lots for us to dig into uh, as we move forward. Thank you for that. Uh, next, we'll hear from Amber Dawn Bearrobe about her work and its relation to our, our topic tonight. Hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. And I hope I have some II students listening and tuning in tonight. Um, so my name is Amber Dawn Barrow, and I'm from, uh, I'm actually born and raised from Alberta, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And it's very cold up there right now. It's already snowed in my hometown, so I'm glad I'm not there. And I'm just gonna share my PowerPoint here. Okay, so this is my name. Amberdon Bear Robe, not Amberdon Bear Pro or Amberdon Bear Rose or Amberdon Bear Gold, is Amberdon Bear Robe. And I'm an assistant professor in art history at the, in the Museum Studies at the Institute of American Indian Arts located in um, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, so you, I am a professor first and foremost, but I'm also a curator and I also do programming for the Southwestern Association for Indian Arts. And I have to uh, say this, the, South, uh, the Southwestern Association for Indian Arts uh, is acronym is SWAYA. Thousands of collectors flock every year, of course not this year because of COVID, but flock every year to collect art from indigenous artists and people flock from all over the world. Sometimes our artists are sold out with but before art market even happens. Um, so because I, I teach many courses in native art history, um, native art history one, two, contemporary native art, history of indigenous fashion. But I, what's interesting with native art history is that the formative years is based on the collection um, of indigenous arts, objects and treasures and human remains from an anthropological collection. So the relationship between art collecting and indigenous arts and cultures is extremely entwined and complex and directly linked to the early years and formation of the, ac of the academia of native art history. And I need to point out that native art history as an academic uh, department is quite new. Um, compared to uh, European and American art history. And Native art history has many obstacles compared to European and American art history. And Indigenous art, until quite recently, and even still now, is seen as a curiosity, primitive, or, cr or craft, and or craft, and has historically been seen as Native, uh, Native art has been seen as something that needed to be, to be saved. So the second half of the 19th century was a period in which museums and institutions established their great ethnological collections. Um, and our constructs in terms of Native North American constructs about what comprises Native North American art history is largely molded by these uh, collections from these institutions and their collection policies. And I, I want to note that um, not there's no blanket statement or one course to cover the rich history that covers Native art history. Um, and what we see in Native art history and what is covered is based on a tiny fraction of art and objects that was collected and that has been able to survive the natural elements, primarily stone, metal, and pottery work. So we really only see a fraction of what um, is the fabric for historical art history. Um, and a lot of times in historical art history and also collections, people look for kind of uh, what is valued often is the most authentic and quote, oldest um, work of art. And this is also known as a salvage pa paradigm, which is an early 20th century anthropological term that describes the belief that it is necessary to, pre to preserve the so-called weaker cultures from destruction from the dominant culture, which is ironic because when the dominant culture first had contact with native North America, their main goal was to actually uh, to, de to destruct and to destroy 
quote, the weaker culture, uh, Native North American culture, art and culture. Um, so the nostalgia for pure and noble, quote, Indian art in the past fueled the curio trade and at its height in the 1880s and 1930s, we saw museums filled and private collections filled with staggering numbers of indigenous arts and artifacts that were often um, unethic unethically um, collected, uh, stolen, or um, basically forced to be taken from communities such as uh, if somebody was in prosecution and put in jail for the potlatch. Um, so generally these collections that we see in museums are, are, or private collections are then interpreted and written about by social scientists such as early anthropologists, museums, curators, dealers, and collectors. And often these social scientists and anthropologists and collectors would even sometimes make up a story and make up um, uh, stories about these artists so that the value of their collection would increase and this story was often um, it would feed into this nostalgia a romantic notion of the 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 either the savage or the um, the noble Indian um, so it is important that artists now and uh, contemporary artists and collectors are and um, curators and uh, scholars and people such as myself who are teaching in institutions at the Institute of Amer American Indian Arts, that we continue not to throw everything out and not to negatively critique everything, but to look at this historical information and to examine this information um, and to reinterpret it from an, an Indigenous perspective and going forward to collaborate with Indigenous, um, to collaborate with, sorry, I'm just going to stop this. Sarah machine. So from going forward, it's important um, to acknowledge this history, such as what you were just talking about, Chris, but to look at this history and not to throw everything out, but to re-examine this and what does this mean from our, from our different perspectives of where these works of art come from, and to collaborate, to have mutual respect and a learning and a listening process going forward so that we can learn from these really important collections and each collection is so unique to each region part of the world that it come that it comes from and it's a really complex but um, a complex uh, situation but it's definitely worth something to discuss and that's it <laughs> thank you Amber Don that's um, you know that was a very uh, quick but but informative rundown of sort of some of the the key issues facing um, collections of, of native and indigenous uh, works. Um, finally, I want to to bring it to Renee Alveston, uh, who will uh, share some of her research and work. Great, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I currently serve as the Associate Museum Director for Kirkland Museum of Fine and Decorative Art here in Denver, um, but I am also a provenance researcher. Um, I serve as an um, independent historian and researcher for different institutions or collectors um, that might want some clarification on their collection um, around uh, <clears throat> ownership issues or gaps in history um, of sales history of particular objects and artwork. My specific area of focus is on the Nazi era. Um, so any uh, works that were created prior to 1945, um, really mainly artwork, fine art, paintings and sculpture. Um, when you're looking at ownership history, gaps in, hist gaps in ownership between 1933 and 1945 are major red flags um, to establish clear title. Um, and this is, um, holds true for collecting institutions, um, third party sales, um, auction houses. Um, all of this work is, is very important to um, make sure is, is happening prior to purchase or in uh, conducting surveys of collections in museums. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of funding that uh, typically gets allocated for this kind of research. Um, and so that's where somebody like me might come in um, as a contracted researcher and do that work for you. Um, the Nazi era looting is, um, tends to be a little bit, um, fraught with a lot of different issues, whether it's um, ethical or um, legal sales. Um, a lot of it comes into play when you're talking about um, work that was wrongfully 
purchased or purchased under duress from a lot of Jewish collectors, um, from a lot of museums coming out of Europe. Um, just a quick background on Nazi era looting. Um, during the war, Hitler uh, decided that he wanted to build a multi um, cultural complex um, in Linz, Austria. It was to include uh, a dedicated opera house, um, a different music halls, as well as a museum called the Fuhrer Museum, where it was to house Europe's finest art collection. Hitler was known to go through many museums um, and uh, private collections um, and take essentially what he wanted. Um, he directed the a certain uh, unit of the Nazi army to go out and um, essentially just plunder what they wanted. Um, all told, about 650,000 works were stolen or 20% of Europe's artwork. Uh, these were stored um, in various parts of Europe, mainly in salt mines. Salt mines were a very good place to store these artworks because of um, the level of humidity and uh, the artworks were kept uh, very safe actually in these salt mines. Um, at the end of the war though, the military decided to uh, form uh, a special unit called the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives Division. It was comprised of about 400 men and women um, from really all walks of art life, art curators, uh, draftsmen and women, um, uh, art directors, uh, gallerists, they were all uh, collected and formed this unit um, that came to be known as the Monuments Men, which some of you in the audience may be familiar with. Um, there was a movie not very a few years ago that highlighted this. These Monuments Men were tasked with going into the salt mines and recovering uh, all the different artworks that they came across. Um, here you see some Monuments officers um, carrying off some of this artwork to be repatriated back to um, either the museums they were stolen with and um, where they could, they were repatriated back to the original owner. There were still about, uh, at the end of this program, there are still about 100,000 works that are still out in the ether. They're both here in the US and in Europe. Um, and where I come in is really looking at uh, the backs of, of paintings and seeing what labels might be of interest where I can trace some ownership issues uh, or some ownership uh, with other galleries. Here you're seeing some close-ups of some labels that are on backs of paintings. The one on the right here with the number, this is from a uh, Parisian gallery. And what I might do is go into some archives and look at old sales records and try and make sure that there's a chain of ownership um, from one gallerist to another or one dealer to another. Um, where the problem lies is if I don't find a clear uh, chain of ownership, uh, then that object is flagged for either further re research or um, just outstanding uh, to say we can't find a clear chain of ownership to this and um, some institutions might put it out publicly on their website and say if you have information that this might belong to a family um, or to an heir, you know, contact us. And that's really where you get into this ethical obligation of a museum um, or an owner uh, or an auction house to have transparency to say, we've got some issues with um, ownership records of, of this particular work. Um, and we wanna be transparent and open and say, we can't definitively say um, this, that this object wasn't looted. So um, I've had the opportunity to work with both the Monuments Men Foundation and other institutions. I actually just finished a multi-year project with the Denver Art Museum um, where um, they're about to um, publish um, a, a catalog featuring some, a collection of Impressionist works. Um, this is where I did a complete survey of um, multiple works and went through any, any, every ownership history and was able to definitively say none of the works in this collection um, have any problematic provenance. They all had 
um, straight clear title that I was able to establish. Um, and uh, again, that just really leaves um, sort of, a, I serve as sort of an insurance policy that the work that you have in your collection is good to put on view and you won't have anybody coming forward saying, hey, that work might belong to my family. And Renee, there is a sort of follow-up question to, to your, um, one of your statistics. They were wondering uh, about where that, that figure, 200,000 works uh, of art looted by the Nazis, um, is that sort of a, an accepted number or where that, where that derives from? It's uh, 650,000 works were looted. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, the Germans kept very, very good records of their looting. And a lot of those numbers are established from this very diligent record keeping um, that, the North, that the Nazi army had. Um, many of which uh, these records are available in archives um, that are accessible digitally. So you can actually access um, these record books and go through and start doing some research in there firsthand from um, recording uh, that the Nazi army um, undertook when they when they decided to to take on this this uh, this looting and plunder. Um, so 650,000 is the estimate. Um, and again, there's about 100,000 out there that uh, were not able to be uh, repatriated back um, based on monuments men records. Um, and other records that are out there. Thanks for that. And thank you all for those um, really enlightening introductions. I think, you know, everyone can see that we have some uh, truly terrific panelists with, with great backgrounds and expertise. Um, and it's, it's pretty excellent to, to be able to have this conversation with them. Um, so we're just gonna, we're gonna chat for a minute. Um, you know, there's a variety of topics. If you have, uh, just a reminder, if you have questions, um, throw those in the Q&A. We'll try to get to them either in the flow of our conversation or, um, you know, as we get toward eight o'clock, we'll open it up to some of those questions as well. Um, if you're having technical issues, those go in the chat. Uh, so Q&A for, for questions uh, directed at the panelists. Um, but I'll sort of kick it off with a question um, about um, the responsibilities of collectors and collections um, to the, the objects that are in the collection. And um, a lot of the objects that, uh, you know, that we're talking about, especially Chris and Amber Dawn, um, you know, those weren't uh, necessarily created, um, you know, with uh, an art collection uh, in mind as their future. Uh, those were objects that might have had very different uses and meanings um, in their original context. Um, and one of the things I'm always sort of curious about is, um, you know, what a collection does or an, insti you know, an institution that collects, um, what is, you know, sort of the, the ethical responsibility to the object and um, how is that sort of context and, or recontextualization um, part of, of ethical stewardship? Um, so anyone that sort of has, uh, you know, questions and Renee, you know, the, it, it relates to, to the, the way Nazis um, had a very a uh, specific view of, of, of uh, what is good art and, and, and what is um, degenerate art uh, and, you know, enforced interpretations on even things that we would consider sort of Western and Eurocentric and, and very much artistic. So um, anyone that wants to sort of jump in and, and we'll just start there maybe. Um, okay, I will, I'll, I'll jump in here. Uh, the, um, yeah, the responsibility of, um, of institutions. I, I mean, my, my experience has been that institutions really welcome people to come in and do research on their collections precisely because it's such an overwhelming task. Um, so, I mean, we're, well, while some of these institutions may not be able to have the resources to do the work themselves, um, when they are open to making those materials uh, available and um, uh, two scholars to to do work on them. I, I think that's that's an, an enormous. Uh, that's a wonderful step. But in in some ways, it's hard to imagine them being able to do, you know, a whole lot of direct research themselves without the help of of um, a network of scholars. Well, I think all three of us come from different um, perspectives of what is the museum's um, responsibility because I'm thinking of. Uh, some uh, specific museums, let's say the Glenbo Museum in Calgary or the Museum of Anthropology, University of British Columbia in Vancouver, 
they have the responsibility to reach out and to talk with mm. indigenous communities who are living and who are directly related to those uh, art to those art treasures and works of art that are currently in um, in invisible storage or in um, um, in covered storage. So I think it is, it's, you know, it's really in terms of the collection, uh, what is the museum's responsibility? It's really determined, it, it really is dependent on what the museum has based their whole uh, inventory on and how has that collection been been gathered, such as was it stolen? Was it, uh, it was it um, collected? Uh, so I think Chris, a lot of the work that you're looking at is you know those people are are long and gone and that's a agreed um whereas i uh, you know i i look at uh, collections um and i study collections and we talk about collections in native art history uh of, of i mean my direct father my direct family's um uh, regalia and and outfits are in the museum now so uh, from my perspective it's the museum's responsibility to reach out to the indigenous communities that they are representing and to include the indigenous voice and to work with that and to basically have commitment with those indigenous communities and not just to have a token here's a hundred bucks we'll have a we'll have an unpaid intern to to evaluate and to research these works is really for these institutions to have a commitment going forward and that's going to really be different from um, institution to institution of what that commitment means. But to me, that's, that is a big thing, is a commitment and to include the Indigenous voice. And to also remember, one Indigenous voice does not represent all of the Indigenous people in Canada and the United States. And I think that that's something people often forget due to how Native art and culture has been really positioned to the world is the uh, buckskin beads and leather Edward Curtis photos. Um, so I Indigenous people are so diverse from, uh, you know, the Southwest to California to uh, up up north in Nunavut and Alaska Territory to the Pacific nor Northwest to, to the Woodlands. So it's so extremely vast and different for, for each region that we're covering in Native North America. And then don't get me started on in, in, on world indigenous arts. <laughs> well, I think what you're identifying, right, is, is your, your focus has been on collections where there are identifiable stakeholders. Whereas with, with so many with archeological collections, um, well, <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, like in the materials I'm looking at, uh, literally not, I don't see how even one of them could have been obtained legitimately. Um, right. But so, you know, you're, you're dealing with thousands of materials, but at the same time, um, it can be difficult to identify, you know, potential stakeholders. And sometimes the best you can do is, let's say, um, you know, the current um, government entity that represents them. I think that, oh, sorry. No, no, Renee, go ahead. Um, I think there is a little bit of a different um, onus on institutions that have works that could potentially have been looted, um, in part because there have been um, various government backed. Um, conferences, in particular the 1998 um, Washington Conference on Holocaust Era Assets um, that really started dictating um, what the obligation institutions, collecting institutions have to uh, work specific to Nazi era looting. Um, so there's some pretty clear guidelines um, that have also been written by the Association of Art Museum Directors and the Association, Association of um, Art Museums, um, which most um, museums guide their collecting principles under um, using that as sort of their, their roadmap. Um, so there are some some clear sort of rules that collect uh, collecting institutions should should follow, um, and I say should because of course you're uh, you're constantly hearing um, in the news uh, artworks that are being contested through the courts um, because institutions didn't perform their due diligence on uh, researching their ownership before taking that on. Um, but there's a, a little bit, all of these different areas have some other, some different oversight um, that sort of helps direct, I think, what those, what those obligations are. And I think, too, I think what's interesting between uh, your focus, Renee, and uh, mine in terms of uh, historical uh, collections of Indigenous art is that nobody cared 
historically. Nobody even looked at indigenous art as art, but saw it as primitive curiosity. So there wasn't even any uh, thought process historically to collecting and outright stealing and digging up graves uh, to take this uh, to take this art. So it's not until quite recently, within uh, within the past twenty years, that there has been this shift of like, oh, the, this collection that we have is actually art, and the people that we just took this from, they're still living and very di and directly uh, connected to this art. Um, so it just the uh, kind of the um, the the dominant kind of societies, even perspective of indigenous collections has really shifted over the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting because um, with, with the material I work with, it really wasn't until artists began to pay attention to it, uh, say in the 1880s and later in, in the, the collections in, in France uh, and then into the States. And so on. I mentioned Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, it wasn't until artists began to pay attention to it and identify it as art. And only then did the did dealing in this material explode uh, in, in quantities. So it was, once again, as you're, as you're saying, outsiders putting a definition of art onto the material, whatever its prior role may have been socially. And um, that in turn, but, but the fact that there were no, um, uh, identified descendants who could weigh in and, and say something about what this material was, was for, meant that dealers in particular were free to brand this in any way they wanted. And a lot of the early literature on the figures I look at was all about how they were, um, uh, there's no gods, there's no social inequality, there's no uh, evidence that, of that sort of thing that you see elsewhere in ancient Mexico, no empires, and so therefore, this was a much more um, egalitarian, democratic society. And it's interesting how the early collectors are like um, a lot of self-made people, um, uh, a lot of Hollywood actors, uh, a lot of artists who may have some social cachet, but no money. <laughs> uh, I say that for the perspective of my wife, who's an artist. But... Um, uh, so again, an outsider defining not only that it is art, but also what kind of art it is. What, what, what are the associations with it? And Chris, going back to your, uh, your raising of stakeholders and, and maybe in your field, um, you know, sort of the absence of, uh, you know, since this was, was in the deep past, uh, you know, living uh, folks who, who have, um, you know, either cultural memory or, or a little memory of these objects, um, who, you know, who is hurt by this trade? Um, you know, who are the, you know, the potential victims of illicit trade in these objects? Um, well, certainly people in, more generally in, in Mexico. Uh, as you know, Mexico has had a, a somewhat historically different approach to uh, how um, indigenous people are uh, considered and integrated into society or not. Um, instead of a reservation system, there's much more of a, a very explicit emphasis upon, uh, upon integration. Um, the, the category of Indian is not one that's socially, uh, has been socially considered as, 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 a, as a good thing to be labeled. Uh, and so uh, self-identification is in many places uh, very reduced. Where I work, people do not self-identify as being Indian in any um, in any form, and uh, language is is um, is largely a, a native language is largely extinct. You have to go to some fairly remote areas just north of me, where we have some very plausible descendants for the people who made these these kinds of figures. Um, but in a, in some ways, their political voice in Mexico is co-opted by the government where the government is the entity that owns the pre-Hispanic past of Mexico. Uh, on one hand, that is a, that's a very different legal perspective than we have in the US. Um, but it also, in, in the course of sort of protecting that material by that mechanism, it also removes the actual native descendants from the equation in many ways. Um, and, and then of course, the Mexican government is has made quite a, 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 an effort over the decades to emphasize specifically central Mexico as part of the 
uh, the, the past that's highly relevant for Mexico today. So Aztecs and you know, big cities like Teotihuacan, but you know, there's a whole lot more diversity in, within uh, Mexico than that. And it, it's often glossed over due to political involvement. Yeah, and I just want to quickly add, uh, add on that when you look at North, when you look at Canada, the United States, and Mexico, kind of the awareness and the treatment of Indigenous people and issues in art and culture, it, it's really good up in Canada. I mean, definitely needs work, but then it gets a little shadier in America, and then it's like completely just um, barely even a topic in Mexico. So it's. Um, it's interesting to look at that, and, uh, and I, when I do teach in international indigenous art, uh, uh, yeah, looking at Mexico, there's not much information published and out there on uh, contemporary indigenous artists from, from the region mm -hmm. that, you're, that you specialize in. Mm -hmm. A lot of the questions I've been sort of looking through, there's, there's quite a few already, um, and a lot of them relate to um, sort of, again, that, um, you know, where does the onus lie for, for some of this research? Um, you know, does an individual need to identify something that they think belongs, you know, within their culture or, you know, within their family uh, and, uh, you know, and come to a, a museum or a collector and, and demand restitution? Uh, it does a museum have the, you know, the, you know, should the onus be on them to do that research and, and sort of where is the money coming from to make all this happen? Well, the museums are going to do this on their by themselves. They're not going to be like, "Oh, hey, I want to give all this material back to you guys." Sorry, our bad. <laughs> so, um, it is usually the institutions that are pushed and forced to do this. Um, so, it really is the communities that need to come forth and kind of uh, make a demand and uh, and a protest and um, get the, the the wheels in motion for being this is not right. This this is ours. This was, you know, uh, uh, anyways, there's many different examples of this, but it needs to be from the community level because the museums, the institutions are, are not going to do this on their own will. They're holding on to this stuff for dear life. And I think it's the same for um, outside of collecting institutions, auction houses and private collectors, especially when uh, speaking specifically to um, Nazi looted works, um, if you're in a position to be selling some of these works it, to another party, such as an auction house, the onus absolutely should lie on, 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 the, um, on the seller um, and on the purchaser, uh, but really on the seller. If it's in your position, in, in your possession, um, if you haven't done the work to make sure that it's legally belongs in your possession and then you turn around and sell it again, um, you know, that's, that's the fault lies with you um, for not doing your due diligence. So collecting institutions do have guidance on doing this. Other third party sellers, um, really the onus lies with them and it's, it's really just um, best practice. Many of these sales are under good faith purchase, which is unfortunate because there have been many court cases where the good faith purchaser has lost um, any money that they've put toward purchasing one of these objects because they may have found that it was um, wrongfully taken from an heir. Um, and again, that's where that research needs to come in on the part of the seller and the buyer. So it's really on both ends um, when you're talking specific to um, outside of the collecting institution. And to that end, there's, there's sort of another thread of questions about sort of um, how you as an individual, and it sounds like there are many people in, in the audience who appreciate art and collect it, and especially when they're traveling and other times, um, you know, what is their sort of ethical responsibility or, you know, in practical terms, are there things that they can do as buyers to, um, you know, not be a part of, um, you know, unethically sourced objects or uh, to participate, um, you know, in this, in this larger, um, you know, uh, problem of, of objects that, uh, you know, maybe shouldn't be bought and sold? I know for my specific area, there are... A, a whole host of um, easily very accessible websites that you can pull up if you're even from your phone that you can look through and put in the name of an artist or the name of an artwork. 
um, and, and see if they're in a particular database, if they come up as flagged. I know it's a little bit more challenging for Chris and Amber Dawn for your areas um, because you don't have that sort of trail that Nazi era does, especially around paintings and sculpture. Um, so specific to that area, I do think that there's an ease of doing a, a sort of a, a layman search before you purchase at least a first pass. Um, there's really no reason why, why, um, why you shouldn't be doing that if you're out making a purchase um, and you're not a, a, a fully fledged researcher or art historian. There's so many resources out there for just the, you know, the, the person off the street that they can still do this very easily themselves. Yeah, and I think uh, you bring up an interesting point, Renee, because it is much different for me and Chris, um, because photography was very accessible um, around uh, in World War II. So there's a documentation that happened in terms of this theft and this looting and what went on with, with World War II when it, can, when it comes to the genocide of the indigenous people of Native North America, there's, photography was not invented. Uh, the daguerreotype was not invented. Um, and there was very, there was nobody uh, sketching and illustrating these wars or very few people from the indigenous uh, side. So I guess what I'm saying is that it, there is a much different, harder trail to follow. And, and then, but also um, in terms of contemporary art or art that's made in present time, go to an, indi an, 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 an indigenous institution or go to the Swaya art market. I mean, there's many ways, there's no excuse to buy fakes and appropriated works now in terms made by um, present day artists. You know, don't go to your local five and dime to buy pottery, you know, buy straight from the artists. And there's many, many um, resources to, to get that work, such as um, go to the Institute of America. Anyway, you can research that. But when it comes to historical work, I can go to downtown Santa Fe and you can buy uh, Akuma pottery made from, you know, the 1800s that's just sitting in somebody's store beside a necktie. So it, it, that's a, it's a much different um, trail to follow. And yeah, when a tourist comes to Santa Fe, and I'm just picking on Santa Fe because this is where I currently live, there's, there's no awareness or very little awareness because it's all around you of where you can just buy a kachina, a pottery made from the 1800s. Uh, 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 silver jewelry that looks like Navajo jewelry that was probably manufactured in China. So it, it's really complicated. I mean, there is NAGPRA um, and there are the, uh, the Arts and Crafts um, Board. There are measures that are in place to help with this, but it is still, we don't have the, the art, the Indigenous art police, you know, monitoring every sale and nor should that be the case. But it is much more complicated compared to um, art made for in, uh, from, from your time period, Renee. One thing that's kind of interesting to me, just, just listening to Renee speaking about um, sort of the, the, the base assumptions being used, where um, if you don't know about your particular artwork, then um, the, there, there's the, the burden to find out. What, one thing that's interesting to me for international trafficking in antiquities is, uh, of, of course, there's the difficulty in records and, and that sort of thing. But um, the, you know, Mexico and other countries frequently will um, uh, watch auction sales and they will make, uh, let's say, the recent, you know, Benin bronzes uh, uh, controversy. But let's say they'll, um, Mexico will see some items on sale in an auction and they'll say, uh, you know, those are from here. Um, and it's not that anybody can really doubt that they're from there, but the, there, the, 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 the basic assumption is that it's okay unless Mexico can prove where it came from. And so many of those cases come down to just these, just, just luck of the draw where you find a broken stone stump of a sculpture and it happens to fit the one that's on auction somewhere. But otherwise the burden of proof is on, is on the origin nation and uh, so often. And so, you know, Department of Homeland Security folks or, or others who are engaged in, you know, dealing with materials that they see being trafficked, you know, they can, they can document a lot of stuff, but in, in, unless they can like pin it down at the site let's say where it came from, um, the, the assumption tends to be that, well, okay, Mexico can't prove it. And so they may make 
uh, various, try to intervene and get things returned, but it's very hard to actually get that uh, um, validated legally. Exactly. And one of the, you know, a lot of the questions are, are about some of these issues of decolonizing the museum, of repatriating objects, um, et cetera. Um, one of the, the sort of arguments um, that, that institutions or collections uh, present um, in their own defense uh, and why they won't repatriate it, as you say, Chris, is that, um, you know, that those objects were potentially legally acquired at the time they were acquired, you know, that that 19th century standards apply to something that came into their collection in the 19th century, whereas people that think uh, something should return to its, um, you know, uh, owner, either an individual or a culture or uh, a nation, um, you know, they would argue that, you know, we live in a different time with different standards, either legal or certainly ethical. Um, and, and a lot of the conflict comes from, from that um, argument that um, there's sort of no legal teeth to um, a lot of these these issues because um, you know laws have changed over the years, um, et cetera. And I you know uh, there's a question in there somewhere, but um, I guess you know sort of um, you know laws versus ethics, or you know how hmm. how do you navigate um, current law versus you know law when when these collections were formed? I think you know that's going to be different for each case, but that uh, automatically brings to mind the, um, the 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 potlatch collection that was taken by the government, and that was a law that legally basically stole all the potlatch col uh, collections from uh, Umits, from the Umitsa region, or sorry, not the um, Alert Bay region. Uh, so that was a law in place that if you basically sing and have ceremony and exchange gifts and have a potlatch we're going to um, prosecute you and then they took all of uh, all, all of those works of art so now so that was the law at the time and so now the, so it's just the law uh, works in the favor of the law which is always uh, ebbing and flowing especially when you look at native native north american law and policy so now some of that work is being repatriated repatriated back to alert bay but you know is uh, in terms of the law and policy the law and policy is but at least in in my per, in my view of when I look at Native art history, is always in favor of kind of um, not the um, the the indigenous community where this this work was quote legally stolen. So it's an interesting question, and again, really complicated. Well, and I think when you're talking about the ethics of um, you know, the, the obligation, although there's not a lot of legal mandate requiring that you're doing this research and um, doing full collection surveys, as a collecting institution, and I'm speaking specifically to collecting institutions, you still have an ethical obligation. You are still seen as um, the cultural gatekeeper um, and, you know, you're a trusted institution, you have the public trust that you're doing the right thing with the objects within your collection. And there, and therein, I think, lies the obligation to be doing um, these collection surveys. And I, I know I mentioned briefly before, a lot of problems arise because funding isn't specifically put toward um, curatorial departments to complete these full object surveys. Um, but that's where the uh, ethical obligation of the institution comes in. Um, making a concerted effort to putting budgeting toward those, um, completing those kinds of surveys um, so that you know your collection is complete and uh, has been, um, you know, thoroughly researched so that there is no question. I, I think there, there doesn't need to be a legal aspect of it because that ethical obligation, I think, over, should override um, any kind of formal mandate that you are supposed to be doing it because it's the law, you should be doing it because it's your institution's ethical obligation to the public. But I think, and I don't want to go down the museum rabbit hole because that's a, a big rabbit hole, but you, you touched on uh, in terms of it is the museums who are looked at by the public and seen as the, the, the sayers and the writers of truth. And people, when they, you go to a museum, generally speaking, you don't question what the museum has on show. You don't question, uh, people look at this as, I mean, that's what museums were, uh, went in, um, you know, in New York. Uh, they were used to educate all of the, the people who are immigrating here to immigrate the, the new generations of people. So museums uh, have historically not been questions they, questioned. They look at, they're looked at as 
sayers and writers of truth. And then you have to question, well, um, who has the authorship to curate these collections? Who has the authorship to write about these collections? So then you go down another whole rabbit hole of, of museums that I know that we're, we're all familiar with. But it's definitely connected to uh, just collections and how Native North American art history is really based, the foundation of, uh, I think what makes Native art history so unique to European art history is that our art history is based in these unethical collections that are based in non-native institutions and museums now. And there's certainly entire categories of, of artworks that any collector would have to be highly, highly uh, attuned, right? Sensitive to, to the possibility that, that, um, that these were obtained in, in nefarious ways. Um, you know, I mean, anything archaeological to, to my mind, um, but the material Amber Dawn's talking about as well, right, is, is, is material that even when it was purchased, like Manhattan, or uh, was, was obtained uh, through some sort of voluntary donation from Native Americans, um, you know, all, all, the, all that's under duress, uh, uh, I mean, in, in so many cases, right? I mean, and, and that, that should raise red flags for, for any uh, thoughts of, of collecting that kind of material. Um, and so there is certainly a burden upon any collector who's seeking to make such a purchase to, to look into those kinds of things as well. So, so the, the museum has a burden, collectors have a burden. There's, there's, there's a plenty of responsibility to be passed around here. Well, um, this is, yeah, uh-oh. Can everyone hear me? My internet is unstable. Yes. Good? Okay. Um, it is now eight. Um, I've been trying to sort of keep an eye on the questions throughout. Um, so I don't know necessarily how we'll, we'll change the format, um, you know, but it, make it more about the questions. But, um, you know, there's a, a thread of questions that sort of get at some of the things you guys were saying um, about as, as you research objects, um, and try to, to figure out their provenance, their history, their origins, um, you know, what to do about um, research itself that is, uh, you know, or, or documents that are either forged or um, that you have to read against the grain. You have to question, you know, who's writing this? You know, is it the museum, uh, you know, in the 1950s producing a document that is trying to support their claim and, and therefore has a bias uh, implicit in it? Um, et cetera, you know, how do you unwind um, a sale under duress that happened in the 1930s where there is no witness or, uh, you know, how do you know that that was under duress rather than a willing uh, sale from one party to another? Um, so, you know, with this research, how do you, um, as, as researchers and scholars and um, people who are trying to, to unpack some of this, you know, what do you, how do you read those documents and, and um, you know, and how do you, how much uh, weight do you give them? That's complicated. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. I, I, again, I, I think that um, my area of research is a little bit different because I do have a little more clear material to work with. We have things like labels, sale, uh, you know, auction books, um, dealer sale books. Um, we do have a lot of source material that we can pull from. Um, a lot of it's really just figuring out where to find that material. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Nazis were well known for forging labels on the backs of objects. Um, so you can't always be sure that the label that you're looking at, the dealer stamp um, that you're trying to research is the real dealer stamp. It very well could be a forgery. Um, and for, for my work, what it comes down to is I, I need to see a legitimate bill of sale. Um, you can trace it back to three different owners and it could all be a completely made up provenance um, just so it looks clean um, when it gets to, you know, the customs house and so that there's no question about it. Um, there's just, the, it is, it's very nuanced and it really comes down to where are you finding your primary source materials? It's archives. Um, really anything archival related is um, 
is even going to entail even further research beyond that. It, it, there's some instances where it could just keep going um, and at some point you just sort of have to trust your gut and, and, and I don't know, just feel like what you're seeing is, is the real thing. Um, but also question when something feels a little fishy. I'll it's say, and, <laughs> and again, my, my, uh, kind of, uh, my, my situation is much different than Renee's. A lot of the historical collections in museums are unnamed artists. So it'll be a big kind of glumping of, oh, that's a Blackfoot artist. And that's just a guess. Um, and then it's circa uh, 1850, give or take 100 years, right? So it, it's really, there's no documentation that is solid that you can really trust or rely on. Um, and. I, I think the best way, well, anyways, but, but it just makes me think of when I was um, in college and doing um, an internship at the Glenbow Museum. My cousin was there and he could look at these pictures uh, that were in the, the collections and he could look at works of art and he could tell what family this particular outfit or garment belonged to, moccasins, um, whatever it may be, due to the beadwork design. So um, there's a whole other level of story and bringing um, people in from community to kind of, quote, authenticate where this work of art came from, which would give a much better and accurate record than what somebody wrote down in the 1940s when they just, when it was just an unknown artist under the label of Indian circa, maybe it's from his region, we don't know. I have some similar experiences with people being able to identify particular artworks that they faked. <laughs> so uh, people uh, looking at art catalogs and saying, oh, my, actually my, my dad made that, you know, uh, based off a broken original that, that, that looters brought in to me. And then they said, or they brought in to her, her father and said, uh, okay, first of all, I need you to repair this piece I broke while I was digging into this tomb. And then I need you to make five copies of it. And you know, so and all of these are then going out onto the market. Um, in, in, in reference to the documentation question, what to trust and that kind of thing, um, it's a real, it's, it's a combination of simply poor documentation. I mean, the further back you go, the documentation is really bad as to, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a pig and a poke as to whether you can get some information on a particular piece you're examining um, or a collection. And uh, because so many of these were collected under, um, you know, murky circumstances, and sometimes it was, quote, legal, but an awful lot of the time it wasn't, right? So, so even, you know, the, the benchmark that a lot of places use of, well, I need to at least to see that it came into the country before 1970. Well, that may be sort of reading the letter of the law, uh, and, and, you know, uh, but, but of course, like I said, in Mexico, it was illegal to take these things out of the country as of 1897. And, you know, there's, and then throughout the 20th century, there's a bunch of collectors of pre-Columbian art who, who wrote books about collecting. I mean, they're doing illegal stuff, but they're writing books about it. And, and so sometimes they're, um, they're, they're shockingly open about some of these things. But at the same time, then they'll work in all these, uh, you know, very improbable sorts of stories about how some of it was done. So a lot of West Mexican pieces, for example, um, one collector was, uh, what was it? Um, uh, John Houston, a collector, uh, a, a director of Treasure of the Sierra Madre, right? And, uh, and he reportedly, you know, he, he, he collected, supposedly collected a bunch of West Mexican figures and brought them back from the filming of that movie. Except they filmed it in Durango, nowhere near where any of these figures are, were made or even trafficked probably in that era. And so a lot of it is just sort of storytelling too. There's, there's weird sort of trust networks between the people who are, who are selling, the, between the collectors themselves that makes this a, a super uh, a difficult uh, um, setting in which to, to, to determine what happened. And, and you know, I, I mean, Don Houston, uh, the collector, uh, Billy Pearson, people like that, collectors of pre-Columbian materials, they would also do stuff like, you know, race each other back to the house and whoever got back first uh, or wh whoever won a bet, well, they get to pick a piece from the other guy's collection. 
there's no bill of sale <laughs> associated with things like that. You know, what kind of document, you know, the only documentation is a dubious story in somebody's autobiography somewhere. So, uh, so yeah, there's a whole range of difficult issues. And this is why I'm, I'm, I would love to see much more in the way of what Renee describes, what, right, where the burden of, of uh, I mean, the assumption to begin with is that, well, this is almost certainly a murky collection here and you should almost start from that assumption rather than putting the burden on, you know, Mexico to somehow document the a theft from a hundred years ago. And I, you know, in some ways, I hopefully, you know, uh, Amber Dawn mentioned NAGPRA. For those in the audience who don't know what that is, that's the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which was uh, made in federal law in the United States in 1990, I believe. And um, it provided federal funding for institutions uh, that were, you know, federal, you know, that receive federal funding already. Uh, so that includes universities and a lot of museums and, you know, the Smithsonian, et cetera, um, to do the kinds of research they needed to, to identify potential objects in their collections um, that uh, may have belonged to indigenous peoples and communities, um, particularly human remains, but also objects that were used in sacred contexts. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not narrow, but it's, um, you know, something like NAGPRA where, where there's legal teeth and um, funding behind it, uh, you know, might spur some more of this. Um, you know, one of these related questions that we um, have talked about previously is, is the role of the internet and whether, um, you know, the advent of the internet that, that a lot of these collections are now going online, that um, auctions are sort of held online, um, you know, is that bringing more transparency to some of these, um, both the holdings, the transactions, um, giving people, you know, even if the onus is still on the, the individual to identify it, at least it gives them a, a fighting chance to find something uh, that they may never have found before. Is that, I don't know, what is your experience of how the internet has sort of affected some of this work? Hmm. Well, from a research perspective, the internet is is gold. I mean, uh, we're, we're accessing, we're able to access archives from uh, Europe and these are digitized um, materials that are just as good as going there and getting the real thing. So, um, and I think as far as the databases that I mentioned earlier that are available, um, for, for uh, a purchaser to, to research work in. Um, I feel like the internet is really what's greatly expanded. Um, a lot of works being repatriated or restituted back to uh, their rightful country of origin or owner. Um, so I, I think the internet has done nothing but, um, but positive ways in pushing these kinds of research um, areas forward. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, oh, sorry. It expands, it, it, it expands uh, communication and people can, uh, but it also can expand appropriation. So it, it, can, go both, it can go both ways, positive and negative, but, but that really isn't my, my specialty, so I don't know. I can't answer that. I certainly see loads of fakes on eBay all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, lower quality stuff ends up there. I know one archaeologist who actually wrote an article someplace titled, um, you know, how I learned to stop worrying and love eBay or something like that, because it <laughs> was driving down the price of pre-Columbian antiquities. Um, but, but, you know, the, the auction houses are still uh, alive and kicking in terms of selling pre-Columbian materials too, right? And, but when those auctions are, are now, let's say, um, posted ahead of time online, wow, that's a whole different story from, you know, the old days where you have some little printed booklet somewhere that maybe you'll, somebody will see someday. Uh, so, so like Renee said, boy, that really helps a lot with, um, with, with being able to track these things, document them. Uh, you know, I can sign up and subscribe to different auction houses and I'm seeing things come through and, and, and sometimes, you know, you can track particular distinctive pieces and so on. Yeah, I mean, it definitely gives the buyer more power to research and to, to look mm. at what they're buying ahead of time uh, to, to inform themselves, which, which is good. Let's see, there's a, there is a question about um, 
you know, continued questions about sort of repatriation and, and issues and, and someone sort of threw in the, um, you know, the well-known example of the, the Parthenon marbles, the Elgin marbles that are at the British Museum. Um, the British Museum is one of the first sort of major national uh, collections and was assembled at a time when the British Empire was um, sort of marching across the world and, and would, um, you know, just bring in everything from, from the cultures that they were uh, encountering and, and um, you know, sub, you know, colonizing. And so, um, you know, the museum itself is full of, of things that, um, you know, are, are ripe for potential uh, reparation or, or restitution. Um, but that, those marbles are, are sort of, uh, you know, have been the subject of a, of a long debate between Greece and, and uh, England. Um, and someone is just, they're curious about um, the panelists' opinions about, um, you know, that debate and, and where you might land uh, in terms of, of uh, who has the, the right, um, you know, the right answer. Um, I think, yeah, sorry. Um, I, I, England, I mean, coming from Canada, Canada has a whole different relationship to England. Um, and so what I immediately thought of is uh, contemporary artists such as Lawrence Paul Yuptalupton or Kent Monkman actually traveling to England to basically comment on stuff like that. Because we are still, we still, uh, all of our, our, our money and we still, uh, we are still pay homage to the Queen. All of our money has the Queen on it. And uh, so we're still a, a British uh, country and, you know, we spell color. C O L O U R. Um, so it's um, uh, and and also Jeffrey is like we the, the oldest quote with the oldest Native American uh, collections are uh, are at that museum or at the British Museum is works that people uh, indigenous people. Uh, most of us will never get to see in person because it was taken away from our homeland and we'll never get back. So I'm sorry, what was the question? I just think it is such a, a loaded question. Um, will that work ever come back? Probably not. Will indigenous people where it, this work should right, rightfully be? And there's many institutions to take care of those collections properly that can come back to it. So people in, in uh, North America, Native indigenous people from this, from this land where that uh, work was taken from can see it and it can be back home. This work can, can come back home, but I don't see that happening anytime soon or without a big fight, even with NAGPRA. Absolutely. And I think you know, you just raised a lot of the issues that are that are on um, you know, both sides of, of that debate, whether it's the Elgin marbles, whether it's it's other objects, um, you know, that take just anything from the British Museum, uh, you know, the the answer, the, the, the museum might claim uh, that, um, you know, bringing it back to, um, you know, its original nation or culture um, would put the object at risk that, um, you know, Britain is uh, better able to care for this object in perpetuity and, and they would be sort of better stewards. That was an argument that they might put forward, um, you know, or that um, by having this encyclopedic collection in, you know, one of the world's major cities, they are um, an educational resource for people of the world and far more people will see it um, if in London than, uh, you know, if it went, um, you know, back to, uh, you know, somewhere in South America, for example, um, you know, and, and then, you Well, know, it's kind of like boo-hoo for them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, and the, the, you know, the opposite, the, the arguments on the opposite side is that, yeah, that those are, you know, there are people in the world who, um, you know, and especially the originating cultures are often, you know, they can't travel to London on a, on a whim to, to see these important objects. Um, and the, the notion that uh, they're safer in a, you know, uh, you know, Office, often a Western or Eurocentric museum space um, just perpetuates some of the colonializing attitudes that, um, you know, led to their plunder in the first place. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, the debate yeah. is, is current, but it, it really rests on um, notions of um, property and laws and power that, that are hundreds of years old. Yeah. Jeffrey, I mean, uh, there's some questions in the, in, uh, I'm sorry, Chris, I just wanted to Jump in That's real fine. quick. There's there's a stream of questions um, as well in the in the Q and A about de uh, deaccessioning, especially. It's a bit of a, a change of gears, but especially in the the age of of COVID. Um, 
and then what that would do to the long-term viability of uh, museums, but also the issue of, you know, we've talked a lot tonight about how can a museum be accountable? And, you know, the deaccessioning is, is a fundraising tool for museums that are suffering because of the pandemic. Is there any hope that maybe that will com be combined with some sort of accountability to indigenous peoples and, and to peoples whose uh, loot, uh, art was looted by the Nazis? I just wanted to, um, see, I'm sorry to interject there, but wanted to see if we could maybe go that route. Sure, sure. Um, well, institutions give back to the community it's not going to be raising any money for them exactly so um you know renee will you uh so th th there's a couple of questions wrapped up in there um mm -hmm. one is about why um there has been a spate of deaccessioning is um a, a a museum or collection uh divesting itself uh of an object in its collection um it's not always for sale there's a lot of other reasons you can transfer it to another institution you can repatriate it Mm -hmm. um, but in the era of COVID, um, there have been a spate of these deaccession sales. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, this has come about because the uh, AAM has recently um, issued essentially um, a, a permission stating that they're opening up um, deaccessioning for two years for collecting institutions. Um, to sell works to um, support uh, collections care. Typically, institutions that deaccession works, um, those funds have to go back into um, purchase of um, further objects for a collection. Um, in this instance, it can, the funds can go to support um, an entire curatorial department under collections care, which falls under operating costs, which is, uh, is highly atypical of how deaccessioning works. Um, I know, you know, I, I really don't know of any institution that um, was not adversely affected by the recent closure of five months or longer from revenue sales, loss of membership, um, ticketing. Um, and so I, um, you know, as a director of an institution, um, I completely understand where those operating costs, you know, you get desperate to, to raise funds no matter you know, no matter how they're coming about. Um, so I do think though that these institutions that are going to, um, to embark on this deaccessioning, um, they, again, they have the obligation to have done their due diligence before they clear these works out of their collection um, uh, on ownership. But there's also going to be greater transparency. And we're talking about, um, you know, you, we were mentioning the internet. Uh, I, I'm hard pressed to think of many institutions that aren't going to deaccession some pretty high price tag works that aren't going to have some sort of media around it, some sort of um, website um, announcement about it. Um, so it's, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to have, at least for my area, you're going to have an, a, a, a high um, visible work leaving a museum without the public knowing about it. And so the, that issue of transparency is, is sort of built in to this deaccessioning in this day and age right now. And in terms of just deaccessioning and ethics, um, you know, it's a thorny issue in, in any time because um, the ethical issues surrounding the accessions involve um, a museum or collection, especially a public institution um, as uh, you know, they are stewards of these objects. You know, that is their sort of mission is to steward these objects in perpetuity, uh, ensure their longevity and ensure their uh, availability and access to uh, a greater public. And so deaccessioning is sort of uh, sometimes viewed as an abdication of that role um, or that when the sales happen, um, often it goes from being in a public institution to a private individual collection and is sort of therefore never, uh, you know, won't be seen or, or available to, to people. Public the, I'm sorry. <laughs> if these, if these deaccessionings are going to support um, operating costs of an institution, they can remain open for the public to be able to see these works. I'm not negating the value of the works that, that these institutions may be deaccessioning, um, but for many institutions without this, they would have to close, they'd lose staff. 
um, you, you would lose the entire spirit of um, being a public institution if you can't stay open or staff it adequately. Right, and if those few objects have to go to support the, the care yeah. of the rest, um, you know, it's then- It's a greater good. <laughs> I, I was I was only going to add something along those lines that you know public institutions in particular, you know when when they're so dependent on on this on funding from, you know from a line item on a budget that gets hung up somewhere for who knows how long. I mean you know they're they're trying to hang on in some of these cases, so they're they're just particularly vulnerable right when when you know political issues at a higher level become involved. Absolutely and. Um, that all makes, you know, it's a, it all makes perfect sense. There's a couple of other sort of high profile deaccessions happening recently. Um, and there's been a questions about um, diversity, equity in museums. Um, you know, there's been some at um, Baltimore where they have uh, deaccessioned some of their, a huge amount of their collection of um, really uh, well-known artists, um, almost all of them white males, um, with the aim to um, purchase new art that is that is much more diverse, and um, you know now that they have the the freedom to um, begin to support staffing um, in some of those areas um, that you know to make their their staff more equitable um, and more inclusive, and more diverse, um, and so it's it's uh, sort of ruffled a, a debate about um, you know when is it appropriate to to deaccession. A similar thing happened at um, uh, Syracuse, their university museum. They have a, a Jackson Pollock. That is sort of the reason people often travel to see that museum. They are going to sell that at auction uh, with the intention of buying a, a more diverse uh, set of artists uh, moving forward. And so, um, you know, it's certainly you know debates that that play out um, now and in different ways. Um, you know, when you talk about diversity and representing other perspectives and cultures, um, you know, through contemporary art. We are coming up on 8.30. Um, I don't know, Ira, if you found any more sort of burning questions that we should answer before the end or, um, you know, is there any final remarks that people want to make? I've been checking as you have, um, Jeffrey, the uh, questions. I think we've hit most of the, the major topics. Um, so maybe we should just, uh, we've got about three minutes left. Um, if each panelist would if, if it's very short, but maybe a little wrap up, uh, any last thoughts? Oh, actually, one, one thing that, that is in the questions a lot is um, resources where you can point people to, to sort of follow up on some of the, the things that you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So I actually have a small collection of books I brought to recommend for further reading. If anybody's interested in this particular topic um, that I would like to recommend um, on the Monuments Men, uh, Robert Edsel is the head of the, um, started the Monuments Men Foundation. He's written multiple books. Um, this specific one uh, on the Monuments Men proper give a, gives a really great comprehensive history. Um, I think the Bible for uh, Nazi era looted art um, really starts with the rape of U Europa. Lynn Nicholas is, uh, this is really the, the sort of what launched Nazi era looted art into popular culture. Um, and then a shameless plug for uh, Dr. Elizabeth Campbell, uh, the director of the uh, Center for Art Collecting Ethics. Um, her book, Defending National Treasures, um, also a really fantastic resource. Um, this really discusses French art under the Vichy regime. Um, and so uh, I highly recommend this as well. Thank you. Chris or Amber Don? It's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful panel discussion. Jeffrey, did you want to add something? No, I was just going to see if Chris or Amber Don had any sort of, um, you know, you don't have to have the books with you, but if there are places to point people who want to sort of follow up a little bit and, and um, hone their knowledge, uh, are there places you would send them? Well, I feel jealous. I got to hold up a book now too. <laughs> if anybody wants to know the ABCs, the foundation of Native North American historical art history, this is the to go to book, Native North American Art History, edited by, or, uh, by Janet Burlow and Ruth Phillips. If you ever uh, want to contact me to get any uh, follow up information, please, um, you can get a hold of me uh, through the host here. And I'm glad. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And I hope that um, some of my students joined in. And thank you for everybody else who joined us.
<laughs> well, I guess as long as we're being shameless here, <laughs> I, I suppose I could, um, for those of you interested in, in those uh, shaft tomb figures that I was just talking about uh, earlier, and, uh, and some of the more recent research related to that, uh, we do have a book from, uh, by myself and Robert Pickering uh, that we compiled on uh, and involving a lot of uh, art historians and museum people and archeologists uh, looking at these figures called Shaft Tombs and Figures in West Mexican Society, a reassessment. And uh, Gilcrease uh, Museum put that out. And um, so uh, very colorful. But anyway, um, it certainly brings up lots of problems and uh, connections to the issues of collecting, but, uh, but no solutions, I would say. And I've just learned from our um, moderator that we don't actually have to cut off right at 8.30. It's not like the, uh, the license expires at, at 8.30. <laughs> and uh, so it's actually 8.31. So uh, if the panelists are willing, you know, we can keep the discussion going. I'm here. We can yeah. talk all night. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> um, well, Jeffrey, some... let's oh, yeah. check the questions. Go ahead. Uh, there was just a question about uh, you know whether this was recorded and would be available at a later date. The answer is yes, um, and it'll be sent to I think everyone who's registered. And so, um, if you want to watch it all again, you are welcome. Um, yeah, burning questions. What do we what do we not get to? So much. There's so many things we didn't get to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's 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 a big big world. That's for sure. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have to go because I gotta get I gotta get ready for my class tomorrow. <laughs> mm. But uh, but I can certainly. Uh, maybe uh, just add a, uh, a note of thanks to our hosts and uh, for putting this together and for inviting us. This has been, uh, this has been very interesting. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I get in my little, my little tunnel with my, my own topics and hearing about uh, the work of Renee and Amber Dawn has been really fascinating and really broadens it out. It's great. Yeah, Chris, thank you. I, I love uh, getting out of the, the native art history bubble. And I think it's really important for these dialogues to happen uh, with other cultures, with other departments. Yeah. Um, so that you're, you're just not in your bubble and you think that everybody knows everything about native art history. Or, and <laughs> people do. So having these cross department cultural uh, discipline uh, d discussions are really important. Um, so yes, uh, thank you. That's pertinent for collectors too, because collectors often don't limit themselves to one of these categories that that we necessarily might, might do, you know, and uh, and so they're being aware of the very big, different kinds of issues between between 20th century and pre-Columbian art and native art. Uh, is you know, there's a lot to to learn. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate, you know, Ira and Corey and others sort of thinking broadly about business ethics as well, because I think, you know. We didn't really get as much to um, how much the market drives so much of this, um, these ethical considerations, but we certainly, uh, you know, I think in, our, in, your, in your words, you touched on all those uh, different ethical uh, principles elaborated by Bill Daniels and, um, you know, they are uh, as relevant in the art world and culture as they are in business. I think they're sort of universal. So I think it's, um, you know, applaud to the, the audience and to um, the format for, for looking to art as a, uh, a relevant topic for a business uh, ethics group. And we're just, we just couldn't be more happy that all of you could take your time out to participate. And it was a really good, fluid, uh, vigorous discussion. And you could tell by the number of questions we received and the comments, how well received it was. And we had over 200 people in attendance. And I can't thank you enough uh, for mentioning that. And as you mentioned with the principles of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative, you know, maybe not every word was called out, but clearly, you know, what, what we heard today was a lot about respect and accountability and fairness and then issues of long-term viability. Uh, and then of course, with the internet, the whole issue of transparency. So, you know, um, and I think some people were surprised that a business school was putting on uh, an art ethics program, but you know, it, it, as much as this, maybe we don't want to admit it, the art world is a business as well, and it needs to comply with the same ethical principles as any other business. So I would like to um, give a virtual round of applause 
to all the panelists. Um, and I'd also like to thank again, Corey uh, Cicchetti and Elizabeth Campbell um, for their help in putting this program together, which was invaluable. And um, again, to the Daniels Fund for funding programs like this. So thank you all very much. I think we are gonna uh, end the program at this point. And um, my uh, email address is in the information you've received. If you have any uh, follow-up questions, uh, please direct them to me and I can uh, put them to the panelists, okay? Thank you very much. Have a great Thank evening, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.